We are here to talk about Solartopia, and uh, we have two panelists along with me. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell, tell us who you are? Well, good morning, ComFest. My name is Jen Miller, and I'm the director of the Sierra Club Ohio chapter. Proud Ohio girl. Proud, proud Ohio girl my whole life. And where are you from originally? Shelby, just north of Mansfield, and I've been in Columbus for a long time. And what do you do for the Sierra Club? Well, I'm the director, so I work on all of our various campaign issues, um, both with lead volunteers like Ms. Pat Morita, as well as a wide range of staff. So water, clean energy, fighting coal, fighting nuclear, and many other issues. Excellent. Okay, and here. How do you do? My name is Alec Johnson. I am an occasional Buckeye. I now live in East Texas, where I'm a full-time pipeline fighter up against the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, also, uh, this fall, I'll be on trial in Oklahoma. I hope you'll support my trial. I'm going to be pleading not guilty. I tried to shut down construction. And uh, if I win, TransCanada will uh, not be happy. If I lose, it could be up to two years in jail. So, but. Well, that's a bummer. Yeah. Uh, so we'll want you to talk about your case um, in some detail. And we ha are joined by? Carolyn Harding. And I'm with the Columbus Community Bill of Rights. We Tell us a bit about the Columbus Community Bill of Rights. Let's start with you. Let's start right now with the uh, Columbus Community Bill of Rights. I like that. So please. Um, what's happening in Ohio, there, if, uh, most of you are probably aware that natural gas is coming into Ohio in a big way. And unfortunately, it says it's burning clean. But to get the natural gas, there's a huge waste stream or waste deluge. And right now, they're injecting it in injection wells. And in fact, they're injecting it in our watershed up in Morrow County. So the Columbus Community Bill of Rights is a group of um, residents that have created with a law firm a charter amendment to protect Columbus rights regarding shale gas waste. And it's a ballot initiative. And it will be, we're looking to get 10,000 signatures and put it on the Columbus Metropolitan um, election. And what, is, what does the uh, uh, Bill of Rights say exactly? Tell us exactly what, it, what, it, what it's going to um, entail. Is, is this to hand out? Um, it's one of them. Okay. How many of you are familiar with the Columbus Bill of Rights? Okay, not enough. So go ahead. Well, it, we just finished the language. We're working with a group called Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund out of, out of Pennsylvania, and they've worked with Pittsburgh to keep frack waste out of their water supply. They're working with cities in Colorado to do the same. And the issue is the state has jurisdiction over frack drilling and waste, and um, there's nothing we can say about it, nothing the local people can say. So this will protect Columbus rights to pure water, clean air, safe soil, and local self-governance regarding shale gas um, waste and drilling. So what is the legal nature of the Bill of Rights? Where, where, does, it, uh, where does it fit into the legal structure? Is it going to be part of the uh, uh, Columbus uh, City Charter? Yes. The um, Columbus is... Um, Columbus has a constitution uh, called the Charter, and this is an amendment to the Constitution. Many um, cities have, have embraced ordinances. That's where the city council passes an ordinance to change their policy towards um, an offending corporation. But oftentimes the industry, the oil and gas industry, will approach those city council members and they'll change their tune and they'll change their vote. And it will go back pro shale gas waste and everything else. If we go to the people with a charter amendment, the people have to vote on it. And then the people also know what's going on. And then if we have to change it, if we want to change it, we can. But it has to go to the people again. So you're going to put this on the ballot in the fall of 2014? We just kicked it off on um, Friday at first day of ComFest. And we have almost 400 signatures, and we need roughly 15,000. So we are aiming for next May. But if we miraculously get 10, 15,000 signatures, we will put it on earlier. Okay, so you put this on the ballot with 15,000 signatures. 
and the city as a whole gets to vote on it. And then if it passes, it's part of the constitution of the city of Columbus. Yes. And it can't be overridden unless there's another referendum to change it. Is that correct? Yes. And will this prevent fracking in central Ohio? Yes, it will prevent drilling and it'll, it will prevent all aspects of fossil fuel extraction regarding um, unconventional natural gas extraction. So yes, it will prevent the injection wells, it will prevent solid waste dumping, which we have a permit right on Alum Creek. Currently, the industry is not dumping there, but the permit is valid. And actually, we, ra we raised a red flag, and so now <laughs> they sent that solid waste mm -hmm. into other places in Ohio, which is not good. But Columbus was spared temporarily. Okay. Um, anybody got any questions about this? This is very important. I will say that we used the um, referendum technique uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, uh, at Pickerington Ponds, there was a farm that was about to be developed and it was gonna destroy the wildlife refuge out there. And with the help of a friendly reporter at the dispatch and a great grassroots movement, we did, back then it was 11,000 signatures, and it was about to go on the ballot to prevent the rezoning of this piece of land, and the developer caved in, and the, uh, the land was bought by the uh, Metro Parks. And so you can now go out to Pickerington Ponds and see a 240-acre wildlife marsh that was preserved pretty much the same way, same technique, as is being used here to prevent fracking in central Ohio. So what do you need most of all? I w what we need most of all is folks to, to be aware, to know that this is happening, that, that right now we have 13 active injection wells in our watershed we're not, we're not immune to the frack waste that the folks in the east part of Ohio are experiencing every day firsthand. This frack toxic waste, which is full of endocrine disruptors, carcinogens, neurotoxins, and natural radioactivity, radium-226 from the black shale that they're drilling through. Um, I just want to give you a few, a few statistics. Um, let's see. In the year of 2013, we injected 686 million 990, 900, no, 686 million 900,000 928 gallons of this toxic frac waste into our earth, and um, and from our in-state that that was eight million gallons, and from out of state that was eight million gallons. So we we are also importing frac waste from Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, they're the agency that, has, that have complete jurisdiction over this, um, this waste. They received $3,306,000 for oil and gas permit fees. So basically, we are importing waste and we are making money on it, but this, wa but this waste will have devastating long-term impact. Well, why, who's making money on it? The Koch brothers are making money. We're, people in this uh, tent aren't making any money on it. It's the corporations that are making the money. Right. All right, so I'm sure Mother Earth is really pissed about this toxic waste being injected into her skin, and this is a great way that we can stop it here in central Ohio. There are fracking fights going on all over the country. It's extremely important. Coal is now not, you know, uh, cost competitive anymore. Oil is out to, out to lunch. Nuclear is going down the tubes very, very quickly. Um, and so we need, uh, we need to stop fracking so we can get to renewable energy uh, as fast as possible. Now, you are from the Sierra Club, and uh, you've got a, a gas uh, 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 segment to your campaigning. So let's hear about what you're doing. Say your name again, please. Yeah, so Jen Miller, director of the Sierra Club. First off, I just want to let everyone know that drilling is actually reduced in Ohio than what it was in 2013. Um, actually, folks like BP are pulling out of Ohio, selling their wells because the wells are dry. Um, however, we are still the biggest taker in of waste 
in the Midwest. So um, you'll hear a lot from industry folks about how we need to work nicely with the fracking companies because we have so much natural gas in Ohio that it's a game changer. And the real reality is it's not changing at all. In fact, natural gas in the last six months has doubled in price, according to the Energy Information Agency. Doubled, in pr doubled two times, more than two times more expensive. Um, so at this point, natural gas isn't even um, as competitive as wind. Wind, actually, the states with the highest penetration of wind are seeing better reliability, which you hear all the time, oh, but the wind doesn't always blow. The wind is blowing somewhere at all times, right? Um, we're, ha we're celebrating the wind today ourselves, right? It's, it's cooling us off. Um, so the states with the highest levels of wind in the country are seeing lower prices to customers, and they're seeing more reliability. Um, for example, in the polar vortex, several coal plants shut down, and it was the wind in West Texas and Minnesota that stopped rolling blackouts, okay? So, um, so gas is more expensive than ever. We as a state have decided that we're open for business, and we've all heard this from our friend John Kasich many times, right? Um, and part of the way we're open for business is we're gonna take the junk from other states that nobody wants with all that toxic, toxic frack waste and we're gonna inject it into our systems. And that is happening all over the state and that is a big concern. Um, but the advocacy has to happen not just at the local level, it has to happen at the state level because state law actually says that there is no local control. So I really appreciate this effort and it takes Columbus and some of the big ones to push this, but we're still gonna have to do more work for that to be operational. Um, so, uh, but uh, um, what else did you want me to talk about? Uh, solar is also coming down in price, so the only thing that's really changed in the last five years is nuclear is as expensive as ever. There's never been a more expensive form of energy known to humankind. Coal is literally, Wall Street will not back it because it's so expensive it's so old, it's so dirty. Natural gas is dirty, very expensive, and by the way, also has very high methane emissions um, and very high carbon emissions. Solar is going down in price. Um, wind is going down in price. Storage for batteries is, is very close to being ready for homes at this point. Okay, let's, uh, one sec, okay, because uh, you mentioned nuclear. We have Pat Morita, uh, stalwart of the Sierra Club for many. Uh, well, she's way too young, but you know, come up, Pat, for a minute and tell us about this uh, uh, leaflet you have yeah. and uh, what the Sierra Club is doing about nukes. You know, we have two nukes in Ohio uh, at Perry, uh, the Perry plant uh, east of Cleveland, the only, the first reactor in the United States to be damaged by an earthquake, actually, <laughs> amazingly enough, and the Davis Bessey reactor, which is insanely uh, dangerous and expensive out near Toledo. Uh, the Sierra Club has been campaigning uh, for many, many years, and you have something you want to talk about real quick, Pat, please. The, well, the waste dump in, in Canada, among other things. Yeah, I wanted to mention um, I, on, um, two things. One, I'm going to put some I'm going to put some literature out at the back, and there's a, just a few. I didn't think about bringing enough today for, for everybody, but please take, take one. Um, the, the dump, yes. Well, so we think about what's our local nuke and that, but we don't think about these are all over the world, and they're in Canada, and they're at the Bruce reactor on Lake, um, the Bruce units on L Lake Huron, there are eight reactors, and they got a lot of waste stored right there next to Lake Huron, so what, what can they do with it? Well, right there is a good place to bury it permanently, about a half mile down in limestone. Well, limestone is only very slightly permeable, but we say very slightly permeable is permeable. And the Great Lakes have only been there for like 12,000 years, so what's going to happen you know, to this waste that they want to just get rid of for now? So Canada's uh, been several years in, the, in, um, in trying to get this waste, uh, get the authority to bury it there. And uh, they've got a joint review panel that's looking at this. And um, a lot of people have testified. They have taken testimony from us that we've been able to testify over the phone. But it's really, um, they've bribed the town where the, in Cardin, Ontario, where the, 
dump is to be located, they've given them a lot of money. So the people there, well, it's not everyone's in favor of it, but a lot of people, the majority of people are in favor of it. So that's what happens. You want, uh, you want nuclear waste in your town, we'll give you a lot of money. So um, we are, currently we are going to uh, attempt to get some kind of a resolution in, the s in Ohio State House because uh, there is res a resolution has passed in the Michigan Senate uh, there are people are finding out about it and they're incensed because that's coming our way. It's coming right down uh, from Lake Huron uh, into uh, Lake Erie. And of course Lake Erie is our shallowest, our shallowest lake. And our, the most fish in our, in our lake too. So, and 15 million people get their drinking water from the Great Lakes. So um, if, you s if um, well, when you see that issue, uh, you're, we'd love to have people bring that up to your state legislators. Okay, so uh, Pat Morita has uh, uh, stuff about nukes back there. And um, let's talk about some big picture stuff now. Um, uh, it was important to get the local and chime in. Did you have something you wanted to say? I'm interested in trying to understand how, if a local bill of rights passes, okay, for, for Columbus, how the state can fight that and what we yeah. can do to overcome the objections of the state. Yeah. So the, the concern is obviously that if, if the city of Columbus passes a resolution or a, a charter amendment against fracking, what can the state of Ohio do, swoop down and overturn it? Can we talk about that? It's not against fracking. It's a bill of rights that we, the people of Columbus, deserve and have a right for local control, pure water, clean air, and safe soil. So it's a right, rights-based initiative, not a ban on fracking. So when they come against us, either the corporations or the state, they're going against the people's inalienable rights for clean water, clean air, and safe soil, and local governance. Right, and here's the real point, is politicians are gonna want to win Ohio, right? So even if this, I mean, and want to win Columbus, so even if the state tries to supersede that Bill of Rights, and they have the jurisdiction to supersede that Bill of Rights, it would be very dumb for them to do so. Does that make sense? So we still have to work these two angles. Um, we fought the law hard fought the law change that took away local control. And I'll just tell you that throughout the state, Mansfield's actually a really hotbed for fighting the local control issue. Um, but there's places throughout the, the northeastern corner, especially too. Um, so this is a very good tactic and a tactic that I think in the long term could have some really helpful implications. I just want everyone to know that we have to do this, but we can't be done, right? We have to keep going back to the state house and fighting this, because also they're drilling in our state parks, yeah. they're they're drilling in our state forests, you know. So there's and, and there's less than one percent of Ohio is made of forests, and they're drilling there. So so we do have to, all fronts. right? We all have to fight on all fronts. Yes. It is shocking how and and it's a good question if the state can overrule the city just like the feds overrule the states on medical marijuana and things like that. And uh, we do have a, a government in the, in the state house that's owned and operated by the corporations and the Republican Party. I mean, this is a, an astonishing situation due to gerrymandering. This state uh, went solidly for Obama in 2014 and solidly for uh, 12 and uh, solidly for Sherrod Brown, a liberal Democrat in the Senate, U.S. Senate. But um, and so statewide, the, the, the state is, is overwhelmingly Democratic, and yet the state house, uh, the House and the Senate, are, are basically two-thirds Republican. And this, the congressional delegation is what, 14, 12 to 4, uh, Republican versus Democrat. We are totally gerrymandered in this state. So um, it's really a concern, and th we, we're lucky in this state that we do have the referendum and that we can vote on these things directly. And w I'm sure that when, the, when push comes to shove, that there will be millions of dollars spent in Central Ohio to defeat the Bill of Rights. We can anticipate that. And all sorts of lies will be told about it. 
Uh, you'll be told you'll freeze in the dark and all that other crap. So um, uh, let's move ahead. I want to talk about big issue, and you'll talk about big issue. Very quickly, uh, the concept of solar topia, um, and I did write a book about it, and there is a Pete Seeger music video. Uh, go online and Google Pete Seeger, the great folk singer, uh, solar topia, and you'll hear a wonderful four and a half minute um, YouTube uh, of a song that Pete Seeger wrote with David Burns and, amazing enough, me. Um, it actually won a Grammy. And this is the book, Solar Topia. Solar Topia is a vision of a green-powered Earth. It basically says that we, it's, a, it's a mythological airplane ride in the year 2030 looking down on the Western world. We don't get to China or India. Uh, that has been solarized. And, you know, it was kind of a pipe dream way back in the 1970s when we first started the No Nukes movement to think that the whole world could run on renewable energy. But as Jen has pointed out, there have been tremendous advances in renewables. We now have an entire state in Germany, Schleswig-Holstein, where those big black and white cows come from, uh, that has been running 100% on renewables. This is, you know, Germany is not exactly hippie heaven. Well, there are a lot of hippies in Germany now, but it's, it's not exactly a frivolous country. It's the fourth largest economy in the world, the biggest economy in Europe, and they have made the decision to transition 100% to renewable energy. No more nuclear, first of all. No more coal, oil, or nukes, or gas or what I call King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas. And they are the, the, the large corporations, and this could not have happened in Germany without the cooperation and consent of the large corporations, Siemens and all these other big, big dudes. And the, the woman, the prime minister of Germany, Angela Merkel, is not exactly a flower child. She's a chemical engineer and, um, and uh, is, is known as being center-right. Now, they, they were, a lot of this happened because of Fukushima, or some of it happened because of Fukushima, let's put it that way. And those of you who are interested in the really bad news, you might want to Google, it's also, it's at the uh, Free Press website, an article I wrote called Fukushima's Children Are Dying. And the bad news is that the cancer rate, uh, thyroid cancer rate among children around Fukushima, they're studying 375,000 children. The thyroid cancer rate among the children near Fukushima is 40 times normal. 40 times normal. There are over 120 cases of thyroid cancer among children around Fukushima where three would be expected. We also have a situation <clears throat> where almost half about 48% right now, but it will tr go past half at some point uh, of the children in the Fukushima area have thyroid abnormalities, mostly cysts and tumors on their thyroids. And this is obviously cancer waiting to happen. And there's a clear explanation for it. I'll get you, Araya. Uh, uh, when, when a nuclear disaster happens, or even when it doesn't happen, n nuclear plants normally emit iodine-131. And iodine-131, iodine will go to your thyroid. You have to have thyroid. Your thyroid needs iodine. If the thyroid, if the iodine that goes to your thyroid is radioactive, iodine-131 is a beta emitter. It emits electrons. And the, and the iodine gets in there, radioactive, and the, the, the electrons will destroy iodine, uh, your, your thyroid uh, tissue. And, uh, and if in small children, the thyroids are growing very rapidly, and so if their thyroids are harmed by, by electrons, they will get uh, abnormalities and probably cancer. The last thing that the developing child wants is, a, is an impaired thyroid. Uh, adults can actually deal with it, but children, it has a terrible impact. Um, Araya, did you want to say something? What's that? Uh, well, I'd actually like to start with the Prime Minister of Japan right now and put him off the planet because he's very pro-nuclear. But th th it's an impossible situation to, to deal with. Fukushima is huge. I was in Japan in the mid-1970s. We, 
marched against Fukushima. People said, what the hell are you doing building a nuclear plant in an earthquake tsunami zone? And this was not unanticipated. And they, the, 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 the industry and the government said, oh, <coughs> it won't happen, and we, we are sufficiently um, uh, protected. But, you know, as we find out, it is absolutely not the case. At Fukushima, they're still dumping 300 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean every day. And these jerks, you know, they go around on these TV shows, these pompous windbags, and they say, well, it's not enough radiation to harm anybody. The Pacific Ocean is huge. First of all, it's bullshit. <coughs> they, they have found, they have tested, and I, I will get to you, by the way. Uh, they, they have tested uh, 15 tuna were caught off, uh, uh, tested off the coast of California. And all 15 showed radio radioactive contamination from Fukushima. And then they'll say, well, of course it's not, you can eat the whole tuna and it won't hurt, harm you. Well, what is this radiation doing to the algae and to the, to the phytoplankton and to the, to the starfish and to the reefs and, and to all the microorganisms in the, in the ocean that we depend on? Uh, there are people with reports now that the ocean is dying. Uh, there's a guy who sailed 3,000 miles uh, in the part of the ocean. He said he didn't see anything at all alive. And so, you know, this is the death of life on Earth as we know it. And so all the nuclear plants need to shut. Right, and because they're all at more risk because of the serious storms that are coming about because of climate change. Yes, and also, <laughs> if you, what's that? Right, they they're are at the end. Yes, they're old, the, you know, like me. They're, they're at the end of design life. I'm 68. <laughs> Some of the reactors are almost as old as I am, for God's sakes. And uh, fracking. You know, uh, fracking causes earthquakes. And these idiots are fracking near nuclear plants. Actually, it's the injection. For sake. It's the injection that causes. Yes, and uh, I have read now that Oklahoma, which is being fracked to hell, has more earthquakes now than California. We're creating earthquakes. And they are fracking near Davis Bessey. God forbid there should be an earthquake at Davis Bessey. That thing will crumble like paper mache. That thing is really old, decrepit, horrible problems. Yes, young lady. Where did I read what? It's on the, on, on the internet. And go to nukefree.org, N-U-K-E-F-R-E-E.org. Thank you very much. For my, I, I edit nukefree.org. So fracking is beating the hell out of our planet. The, the premise of Solartopia, which was visioned as a pipe dream many years ago, in fact, in 1975, when we first in Western Massachusetts started finding nuclear power, there was a uh, Toward Tomorrow Fair at University of Massachusetts. And people talked about this, and we had this vision of a green-powered Earth, and everybody said, oh, it's decades, decades, decades away. Well, what has happened is our movement, our environmental movement, our green power movement, our movement against nuclear power, has actually birthed the biggest industry in the history of the world, which is photovoltaic cells. Photovoltaic cells will be, dollar-wise and employment-wise, the biggest movement in history, biggest industry in history. Photovoltaic cells have plummeted in cost. These are the flat panels that convert sunlight to electricity. They have plummeted in cost, and they have risen, soared in um, um, uh, efficiency. My nephew now is in, I have two nephews in Washington, D.C. One of them is a professor of solar energy at George Washington University. They have just put in a huge solar array at George Washington and American universities in, in D.C. that will provide, in some cases, 100% of the electricity being used in many parts of these campuses. This could not have been done even 10 years ago. My other nephew uh, is, is selling window glass that has photovoltaic embedded in it. And so you can build a new building, and you won't be able to distinguish the window glass from any other window glass, but it produces the electricity used in the building. Now, all this stuff is happening all across the board. And the reality is, as Jen said, photovoltaic cells are the cheapest, and not only the cheapest, but the cleanest, safest, most efficient, efficient and most job producing, but they are the cheapest form of en en new uh, genera electrical generation out there. 80% of the new energy capacity being built in the United States and in much of Europe is renewable, mostly solar and wind. But you've also got, now we're on the brink of legalizing marijuana, you've got hemp coming. Hemp is a great source of renewable energy. The seeds produce oil, and the cellulosic stems and leaves uh, can be uh, fermented into, uh, into ethanol. 
Uh, you have a, a geothermal, ocean thermal. You have uh, windmills that are now underwater that are turned by currents. You have tidal energy, uh, wave energy. Wave energy is my favorite. They have these big things that look like sausages. And they just sit out there and they go up and down and they squish water. Uh, and so all this stuff is happening now. And what we have in power in this country is a fossil nuclear, coal, oil, nukes, and gas, King Kong, fossil nuclear industry that can't let go, that spends hundreds of millions of dollars on these, on these interchanges and these winding these highways, kills trains, kills uh, mass transit, uh, does everything in its po power to protect the horse and buggy uh, 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 automobile industry. We have in a situation now, I love it, all these free market guys, uh, you know, uh, the right-wing Republicans, the Koch brothers, who say they're against taxes ex except when it comes to solar. All these market guys are trying to kill the electric car. Again, you know, why did Detroit die? Detroit died because the morons who ran General, Electri General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford would not build energy-efficient cars. They had two shots at it. In the 70s, right, in the middle of the oil embargo, they had the opportunity to, b to downsize these cars and to make them solar, make them efficient, and they wouldn't do it, and so who came in? Honda and Toyota, right? Then they, in the 90s, they had the chance again to build hybrids, and they wouldn't do it. Who built hybrids? Again, Toyota and Honda. Now, these guys don't want to build the Tesla. The Tesla goes from zero to 60 in four seconds. You know, they're, they're, they're complaining that they, we don't want to have Tesla um, dealerships because they won't service the cars. Here's the problem. Here's the secret. Electric cars don't need service, for God's sakes. The, br the, the, the brakes can go wrong. You know, the CD player might break. But electric cars are so much more efficient than gas and oil cars. You don't change the oil in electric cars. You don't have to, you know, piddle with all these other things that they have to do at, at the service stations. And so, you know, we're on the brink. We're actually over the brink already on the greatest technological revolution in human history. It's part and parcel of the internet. The internet, of course, changed everything in the 1990s and onward. Can you imagine what we would be without the internet? If you had described the internet to college students, which I was one in the 1960s, it would have qualified as science fiction. The, you know, the idea that you could send messages instantly all over the world, all this stuff, the internet has completely transformed the human consciousness. But what's coming now, and, and, and it's part and parcel of the internet, is the renewable revolution. It's all digital. It's all, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on, on wafers and silicon. And it is happening so fast. What we have is, a, is the Koch brothers standing in the way because they're invested in King Kong and coal and nuclear. But when we get them out of the way, we will have mass transit. We will have renewables. Everything will be, if we can get there, if we can prevent the frackers from destroying the planet, if we can prevent more nuclear meltdowns, God forbid, we should have another TMI, Chernobyl, Fukushima. Um, you know, if we can stop the Gulf spills, for Christ's sake, before they kill everything, we will have this transformation. So do you want to add to that, please? How do you do? For those of you who just came, my name's Alec Johnson. I'm an occasional Buckeye. I now live in East Texas, and I'm proud to be part of the Tar Sands blockade. But I, first, what I'd like to do is I would like to associate myself with all of the remarks made by the previous speakers and definitely underscore the efforts that they're all making. I admire Sierra Club tremendously. And I got to tell you, this community uh, bill of rights that you're working on is huge. This is not only the quickest way you can protect yourselves, but the way you can revive authentic democracy, the real deal. So I want to support that as much as I can. I wanted to talk for a bit, though, about some real big picture stuff. I want to put this in context. A couple of years ago, Bill McKibben wrote an article. I think it, I'd encourage you all to read it. It's called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And here are the figures. We can afford to put 565 gigatons of carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere before we basically have runaway global warming, before we're in a position where we can't do anything for millennia to correct it. 565 gigatons. Well, dig this. The industry has 2,765 gigatons that they are determined to ignite for profit. That's almost five times our budget. That's one of the reasons why Bill McKibben correctly calls this industry a criminal enterprise. Their project is to destroy our children's future. They're doing it with all of the elements of King Kong that you mentioned. So this is huge. But here's the thing, if you actually work these numbers, 
What this means is that our movement, everyone here alive today, has to see to it that 80% of those fossil fuel reserves stay in the ground, 80%. Now, in rough figures, we're talking about $20 trillion. So that means that we've got to somehow be able to tell everything from the governments of Saudi Arabia to the boards of ExxonMobil, all of that wealth you think you have, all of that stuff you're pricing into stock worth $20 trillion, you can't have it. That's what's at stake. It's a big deal. Now, interestingly enough, there is a historical corollary, and this state contributed to it mightily. During the Civil War, the effect of the Civil War was to turn about $10 trillion worth of wealth in the form of slaves into nothing. Before the Civil War started, slaves were worth more than all the banks, factories, and railroads in the United States, and the abolition movement was going to turn all of that into nothing. We have to do the same thing. It is a big deal. And by the way, failure cannot be an option. It's certainly not going to be an option if you ever want to look your grandchildren in the eyes. It's just not an option. You know how much a trillion dollars is, by the way? It's a pretty big figure. Usually your eyes glaze over. I'll give you a visual. Take $1,000 bills, stack them one on top of another, 67.9 miles high, and you got yourself a trillion dollars. Okay? Now, what we have to do is we have to turn about 20 of those stacks into nothing. Okay? We have to fight the fossil fuel industry to its knees. And if we fail, if we fail, the, the consequences will be staggering, absolutely staggering. And, you know, and, and in a way, it's already too late. As Bill McKibben has pointed out, we're already in a changed earth. But if we don't really take aggressive steps now, it'll get way out of control. And by out of control, I mean it'll go nuts in ways that we can't do anything about it for millennia, thousands of years. I'm the father of Eliza and Amelia Johnson. I care about my children. I care about all of our children. This fight has to be for them. They have every right to an atmosphere, every right. And by the way, in, this, in, in our country, there's something known as the public trust doctrine that states that the government looking after public assets has to exercise the highest duty of care, the highest duty of care for our atmosphere. So that doesn't allow them to pander to any corporation or any segment of corporations, no matter how rich they might be, without engaging in the utmost dereliction of duty. So on Earth Day in 2013, when I locked down on heavy equipment in Tushka, Oklahoma, I did so to send a loud message I was enforcing the law. I wasn't breaking it. I was enforcing the law. I was enforcing the right of all of our children to an atmosphere. And I want to thank you for your time. And listen, join us in this struggle. This is your struggle. And we live in a state, by the way, that contributed mightily to abolitionism. This state had, what, over 200 stations in the uh, Underground Railroad. And by the way, there were two sons of Ohio. You may remember their names were Grant and Sherman. And without them, we would not have ended slavery and we would not have ended the Civil War. We live in a great state with a great heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh, Sherman, uh, William Sherman's middle name was Tecumseh, <coughs> who was the great leader, probably the greatest leader ever to come out of Ohio. Uh, Tecumseh, actually, the reason his middle name was Tecumseh was because his parents knew Tecumseh. Uh, uh, in southern Ohio. You want to, Jim, will you talk about, we, we are in, in the embarrassing predicament of living in the first state that has passed a, a law to reverse solartopia and to move against renewable energy in, a, in an aggressive fashion. So can you, Jen, can you from the Sierra Club please talk about that? Thank you so much. You probably heard a little bit about this. It was called Senate Bill 310. It just passed. Um, and many of us fought as hard as we possibly could on this issue. So to, in 2008, uh, the state of Ohio, an entirely Republican General Assembly, with only one no vote, voted that utilities like AEP and up north, First Energy, like, uh, would uh, have to invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, this has had overwhelming success. We have seen significant job growth. We have seen significant drops in our utility bills because when we use less energy, it's like when demand goes up, price goes up, right? So we use less energy, demand goes down, price goes down. Similarly, since we were not putting as much strain 
on the grid by using old archaic plants, as many people have noted, both coal and nuclear. We're using more wind and more solar. That was also driving down costs and increasing reliability in the state. Unfortunately, some folks had amnesia. We still have all Republican legislature, and they decided that they wanted to kill it. And utilities, AEP was absolutely behind this. It hurts my heart, but it's true. First Energy, um, maybe some major industrial customers, and they decided they didn't want this anymore, so they killed it. They killed this law. Utilities are no longer required to do efficiency and renewables. They said it was innocuous. They called it a freeze. We're just stopping for two years to study this thing. Here's the real truth, is what they baked into the law is all kinds of crazy language so that if it does come back in two years, we're not sure it will, even if it does, it won't look anything the same. So now when the federal government changes lighting standards, which utilities have nothing to do with that, right? We just go get a new light bulb, um, that'll count towards the standard. Anything that anyone does that's efficiency and renewables, even the utilities did nothing with it, it'll count. And not only will it count, they'll be able to get shareholder incentives for it. Even if they don't have any skin in the game, they're gonna get to benefit from it. So I wanna say a couple things though. This is really frustrating and I feel really mad about this. Um, I've actually worked on fighting these laws across the country. I was actually the National Sierra Club's expert on efficiency and renewables for three years, fighting this kinds of legislation. Ohio is the first to do it. But there are other ways that we are winning. First off, the nation that cut the most carbon pollution in 2012 was the United States. And you know why? Because we started taking coal plants out. And I, that in some places is not popular to say that, but that was my organization that decided that was how we had to do this. You know, because we had all these old plants that were polluting the water, that were, that were breaking the law, were making communities sick, and so we started taking them to court. Um, so we're winning there. We have a case right now before the Public Utilities Commission where AEP is trying to keep on two nuclear plants that were built in the 1950s, early 1950s, to supply Piketon, old uranium plant, right, down in Southeast Ohio. Two plants trying to get a, basically a bailout. These are gonna shut down because they're so expensive to run now. And what they want is they want us customers Anyone, even if you shop on the open market, because AEP delivers the electrons into your house, they want us customers to pay to keep these online. It's called a power purchase agreement. Now, the Public Utilities Commission said that AEP could not do a long-term power purchase agreement with a large solar company, but now AEP is coming and saying, hey, can you keep these plants online? And it is estimated just over three years, that'll cost AEP customers 117 million. And then in three years from here, they're gonna do it again. And three years from there, they're gonna do it again. Every utility in the state is trying to play this game. And here's the good news is actually, as we said, wind is the cheapest energy, actually. And wind is the cheapest, solar is cheap. Energy efficiency is cheaper than anything, right? Because what's cheaper than not having to make it? Um, so you have the chance to go before the Public Utilities Commission, and I hope you'll come see my tent um, uh, uh, Sierra Club or you'll visit me afterwards, you have the chance to show up as a customer, or I has done it, right, and say, I don't want to pay for this. Don't make me pay for this. Take that 117 million and put it towards energy efficiency where every dollar spent saves three. I'm not even lying, those are the numbers we have from AEP. AEP, their efficiency programs that they just killed before the utility, uh, before the legislature, cost one cent per kilowatt hour. How much are your bills? What do you think you're paying per kilowatt hour as an AEP customer? Probably 10 times that. Efficiency has cost one cent per kilowatt hour and it saves money too in the long run. So what I'm saying to you is we lost that battle. We have not lost the war. We need you to come join us and raise your voice on this issue. And I think that Every leader of Ohio needs to hear from all of us that we care about the environment and we understand actually that doing what's right for the economy is the same as doing what's right for the environment. So please come see the Sierra Club. Thank you. Absolutely, go ahead, please. I wanna do a shout out for the Sierra Club because when we first realized that they were gonna dump frac, um, um, radioactive waste along the Alum Creek, it was the Sierra Club that came and helped us and supported us 
and um, spoke about the issue and continued. In my mind, it takes all of us. It takes the tar sands folks that are out there fighting the tar sand blockade. It takes the people that are fighting nuclear. It takes Sierra Club, the big greens. And it takes the local charter amendments. And it takes the um, Living Simply folks. I mean, it's gonna take all of us. Yes, and Araya. It takes the <laughs> vegans too. Right, well, let's talk about that. I wanna talk yeah. about veganism for a minute. I just wanna thank everyone. It's important to support all of us. Thanks. All right, I, I think uh, we have to um, remember also that, I, you know, I, many, many years ago I came up with the slogan, no nukes, it's very successful. And I think we ought to have a new slogan that says no cow farts. Um, and, and people have to understand and I'm waiting for, I'm waiting, I'm just waiting for the Bill McKibbins and uh, the, all the people who are talking about global warming to talk about the role of industrial meat production. Because industrial meat production is a very significant player in, in, uh, in global warming. Now, I'm, I'm not going to, I can advocate veganism. I'm not going to uh, uh, argue against people who think they need, need to eat meat. I've tried to stop eating fish for many years. It's very difficult for me. I don't know why. But I, even though I know it's radioactive now, I still <laughs> wind up eating it. Uh, but I am otherwise a vegan. And um, the, the, uh, the global warming contributions of the industrial meat industry, cows, uh, chickens, pigs, um, and, and sh uh, what other? Sheep, I guess not really much. Goats, yeah. uh, goats not really much. But, but the, the, most, the most significant is, is beef. <laughs> and um, if you want to eat beef, uh, you know, it should be uh, um, uh, naturally grazed. How, who here has ever been on a feedlot? Who has ever seen a feedlot? Okay, a feedlot is indescribable. It's a small piece of land. If you can imagine this Goodale Park with 100,000 cows on it, standing knee deep in shit, you know, um, uh, so many of them anchored up, and milk, of course, uh, also milk production. It's factory done, and it is a huge uh, p part of global warming. In addition to that, it, it consumes 90% of the grain that's grown in this country. Uh, ca uh, uh, corn. When you drive through Ohio, you see two things in the f in the fields. Basically, you see corn and soy, right? That is not for popcorn and tofu. That stuff goes to fatten cows. The number one industrial, um, uh, the number one agricultural product in America is cholesterol, because uh, all the, uh, literally uh, ninety percent of the grain goes to fatten beef cows, and uh, this is a part of Solartopia. There is no way that we can sustain this kind of industrial production of meat um, and, and survive on this planet. It's a huge global warming factor. So uh, I need, I, we, we do need to take that into account. I'm not saying you've got to stop eating meat. It would be better for your health if you did. It would be better in general for the planet if you did. But industrial meat, chicken, eggs, uh, 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 milk, and, and, and beef are horrific in terms of their impact on the environment. Very quickly, Araya, go ahead. Well, I don't know what I can really add to that, except that I would disagree <laughs> that any animals being exploited is possible because it will always end up, the reason we have industrialized livestock production, because I'm not gonna even qualify it as meat, it's all livestock. Any animals that we're exploiting for this process, there's no way we can do this to you know, support the seven billion and counting that continue to climb in our population on the on the planet. We just have to recognize that the the we are leveling rainforests. I mean, we've lost 80% of the Amazon due to livestock production, predominantly so we can feed soy and get a cheaper burger to our our chickens and our 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 you know McDonald's you know as far as a chicken sandwich or whatever. Chicken is the, m the most consumed animal on the planet right now, in, in, at least in the United States, I should qualify that. And in different cultures, it's, it's goats. So, I mean, you know, the Muslims. But th it's a huge problem environmentally. Okay, but look, yes, go ahead. real quick, you know, and it's hard because we all have to try to work on so many fronts for environmental issues. So I just want to say, all right, I'm actually someone, I have health issues, I really can't go every week without me I, I some sort of livestock i can't but i have choices i can buy local which means it's not getting shipped all over the country i can buy grass-fed which 
means a big difference. I can go meatless many days, and there's a lot of people, a lot of households that just go meatless Mondays, right? Just meatless Mondays. So it's great for our, our friends, and, and she's totally a champion for veganism, and we should applaud her, and if you can do that, I think you should. But if you really feel like my fight is a different fight, but I also really do care about the planet in terms of what I put in my body, because what I put in my body, I become, right? I become cholesterol or whatever. There are ways you can do this. There is a continuum of responsibility when it comes to eating. So I, you know, I never want people to feel beat up like they you know, have to be a certain way. We can do this together, one step at a time. Okay, so, um, uh, yes, did you have a comment? Oh, we have three minutes. Uh, who has a question or comment? <clears throat> Those of you who doubt that we can make an impact, uh, I have to say this uh, obligatorily at every uh, uh, session. When we first started, when I first started with my communal group in, uh, in Western Massachusetts in uh, the 1970s, we started in 1973, uh, to fight nuclear plants that were proposed four miles from our house. And we stopped those reactors. We weren't given a snowball's chance, but we did. And you can go where they wanted to build those nuclear reactors and lie down on the grass. It's a nature conservancy. The, the bulldozers never came in. And the year after we started, Richard Nixon, where is he now that we need him, um, got on national television and said that there would be a 1,000 commercial atomic reactors in the United States by the year 2000. Well, the year 2000 has come and gone. There were 104, and there are now 100. And there's another one going to shut this year. And we, you know, the nuclear industry had this whole big shtick. They were having a nuclear renaissance, and atomic reactors were going to come back. What a crock of shit. And they totally failed. They spent a billion dollars on public relations trying to build new commercial reactors in this country. And the, the net result was that they went, they went down by four and will be continuing to go down. There is a movement in Japan now, very, so far, effective. <laughs> when Fukushima happened, there were 54 commercial reactors operating in Japan. Six went down at Fukushima, and then will never reopen. But there's still 48 there. And the prime minister there, who's kind of the equivalent in politics of Reagan, only further to the right, um, uh, wants to reopen these 48 reactors. And you know what? The public is not allowing them to do that. It's the biggest mass shutdown of reactors. The only good thing to come from Fukushima is that the other 48 reactors are still shut. And so we can make a difference. We have made a difference. And, you know, photovoltaics, which was dis uh, just dismissed as a, uh, a marginal form of, of you know, uh, gyro girlus, uh, fantasizing, uh, it's a huge industry. It will be the biggest industry in the history of the world, just photovoltaics along with wind and other, and other renewable sources. So don't think we're not winning. Uh, but the stakes are we have to win fast enough so that we can still survive what King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas is doing to all of us. Yes, sir. Who? Who's Mark Jacobson? Well, the, the presumption of this book, Solar, Solartopia by the Age, is that we will be totally renewable by 2030. And I, do, I, I think that we have no choice. That's why I picked 2030. If we, we don't get there by 2030, the, the planet will not be livable for human beings. The cockroaches and, and uh, you know, many other animals will be fine. But we won't be here. Our life supports, you know, it's the best of times, the worst of times. Our life supports us. Is, uh, I've read Mark Jacobson stuff. He's not alone. Uh, there's plenty of people out there now saying that we can make this transition, and we have no choice. Uh, but uh, not only are we going to have to do it in energy, but we're all going to have to get behind Araya here and uh, do, uh, it's not necessarily totally vegan, uh, uh, damn close. Yeah. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you all very, very much. This was a great group. Come on up. We have say hi. vegan meat. We have vegan eggs. We have vegan milk. We have vegan ice cream. We have vegan everything. You do not live a life of deprivation as a vegan, and it really is the single most important thing you can do because it reaches everything in society, and it, it is one of the leading... I mean, it, it, is, it, can, it saves the most energy of any other behavior. A meat eater uh, in a, on foot Thank you. does yes. less than a vegan in a Hummer for the environment. So think about that. The diet is that important, and it's not just a diet. It's an ethic. <laughs> a vegan in a Hummer. Is that guy's name Arnold? Okay, uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
I'm reminded that, you know, in a past dark time in our country, when we were fighting for our nation's survival, Benjamin Franklin pointed out, he said, we had best all hang together or we'll surely hang separately. Thank you very much. And since you, since you mentioned Benjamin Franklin, I want to say two things about Benjamin Franklin. He's my favorite American. Number one, Benjamin Franklin invented the lightning rod. And he could have made God knows how much money on it. And he said, you know what? Uh, can you imagine the Koch brothers doing this? He said, you know what? I've got enough money. I'm going to give away the patent. Elon for Musk. The, for the, uh, the um, uh, lightning rod. And now Elon Musk, who uh, one of the major pioneers of the, of the uh, uh, electric car, the Tesla, has given away his patents. And secondly, uh, Benjamin Franklin invented what is probably the most uh, energy-saving invention of all, in all of history, which is the Franklin stove. Because before the Franklin stove, anybody, everybody had a fireplace, and they were incredibly inefficiently just burning wood in the fireplace. 90% of the heat went up the chimney. It was incredibly dirty. Franklin invented a stove where you had a contained fire and way more efficient. So why don't you I just want to wrap up. Stay, Thanks, Harvey. Um, if you are a Columbus resident, you can sign this petition. If you are a Franklin County resident, you can um, come and get on our list because we are going for Franklin County next. And if you are just Ohio resident, you can help us get signatures. We're at booth 118. Columbus Community Bill of Rights. Look us up. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. You've been great. No nukes, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. This is our, uh, Tim, our, our solar topian uh, guru here. Who's, uh, uh, we all should give Tim a big hand. He's one of the unsung heroes of, of uh, Confest. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get those signatures now. She could uh, take some signatures right now.